my name is Tim Matson. I work at uh, Intel Labs, and I'm going to talk to you today about a project that I'm really excited about called PyOMP, PyOpenMP. It's all about putting multi-threading into Python, and uh, we're doing it in a way that's Pythonic and something that Python programmers would love. This is based on a talk that Todd Anderson and I gave at uh, SciPy this year, and the reference is down at the bottom of the slide, so you can go find the full paper. Now, I do work at Intel, and that means uh, I have lawyers looking over my shoulder, and this is the notice that says, don't sue Intel, uh, plain and simple. The disclaimer that matters is on this slide. So these are my views. Um, you know, this is not a talk that's been blessed by Intel's legal department. So uh, these are my views. And if I say something really, really smart, well, credit goes to the people on the next slide because I work with really smart people. If I say something stupid, it's definitely my fault. Uh, don't, don't blame them. Um, and I want to emphasize, I work in a research lab, so I am not talking about Intel products. I am not saying anything whatsoever about what Intel is planning to productize. So by design, my work is supposed to be research and well off any kind of roadmap. So keep that in mind. And I always like to start by giving credit where credit's due. Um, the inspiration for all this came from Michael Peltier who uh, has a company called Graphagon, and he has done some absolutely brilliant work in the graph laws. And if you want to track down, if you do work in graphs and graph algorithms, definitely track him down, graph laws, wonderful stuff. At any rate, he has extensive experience with Python and has taught me so much about the Python language and was the inspiration for the design of PyOp. Um, Todd Anderson works with me at Intel and uh, he's an official blessed uh, uh, wizard hat wearing Numba wizard. And in terms of the hard implementation work, diving into the guts of these complex software systems uh, that are behind this, uh, that was Todd. And then we're working with uh, two people at uh, Lawrence Livermore and Argonne National Labs and basically taking what we did here at the back end, mapping onto LLVM, and mapping it onto an open source version of LLVM. Todd and I worked with the Intel version of LLVM, and all the performance numbers in today's talk will be from that Intel version, but to really get people broadly using it out in the real world, it has to be on an open source version. So I'm really thrilled that, uh, oh boy, okay, I'm gonna try and pronounce her name, Georges and Johannes and they're gonna hear this and tease me unceasingly about the fact that I'm sure I mispronounced their names. But at any rate, they're heavily involved in a movement to create an open source, open MP enabled LLVM. And they're working with us to map our number work onto their LLVM work. And the GitHub repository at the bottom of this page is where you can go to follow that work. So let's get into the guts of the talk. So I'm standing in front of a bunch of people at SciPy, and these are all Python people who like to think they're doing scientific programming. Oh no, stop, I shouldn't be so cynical. They are doing scientific programming. What, but what they're not doing is high performance computing because Python performance is just not very good. Uh, that's to put it lightly. And so to start this, I wanna talk about this paper that's, that's really making the rounds in the corporate ranks. Um, because it's, it's something that even a manager can understand. And it says there's plenty of room at the top. What will drive computer performance after uh, Denard scaling? Okay, not Moore's Law. The, the people on this paper knew better. It's the end of Denard scaling, not Moore's Law. At any rate, um, the point is that in the future, well, or the last several years and now moving into the future, you're not gonna get performance for free just from semiconductor technology. You're gonna to have to go through and come up with more clever hardware, better algorithms, and most importantly, you're gonna do a lot more work in software. And their point is that, yeah, there's an awful lot you can do at those levels. So we can keep giving you great performance, but it's coming from the top. Now, this is why I like to talk about that work, um, because this table we produced from their paper kind of summarizes it all so nicely. They took this simple matrix multiplication routine as their starting point, 
And you've all seen this before, the triply nested loop. You know, it's, it's how we learned to ma multiply matrices in grade school. Um, and so, um, and, and by the way, of course, we all know there's better ways to do a matrix multiply. The point is to have a proxy to work from that uh, represents nested loops. And so then they went through and they started with Python, they then went to Java, then C, and then they did all sorts of stuff. And they tracked the fraction, the peak performance at each step of the way. And I love this one because <laughs> if you look at that last column to the far right, where they're giving you the fraction of peak performance, and Python gives you an absolutely blazing 0% of peak performance. Uh, you know, if you round to the number of significant figures they have in their studies, it's basically to within tiny rounding error, 0%. Um, and this, this feeds into an attitude that is common in the HPC community, which is, go ahead, use Python for uh, pulling together lots of independent programs to build a workflow. Uh, use Python to experiment with different algorithms, to analyze your data after the fact. But gosh, when you're ready for something with performance, use a grown-up language. Okay, come on, you know, grow up. Recode and see. Well, that doesn't work. I mean, yeah, it works. But people nowadays are learning Python. People nowadays are working with Python, and that's becoming their, their common language. Therefore, in the world of computing, I feel it's kind of our responsibility to help programmers keep it in Python. I mean, frankly, if you look at where modern, modern technology is going, there's no reason we can't start from Python and give you high-performance code. Look up my paper, the uh, paper I wrote with a bunch of people, uh, The Three Pillars of Machine Programming, where we dig deeply into this. So I should be able to express the intent of my program with Python, and then I generate high-performance code. Now, th this is going to take a lot of work and a lot of research, but in principle, this is where I think things need to move. And we are actively working on that in my group. So we are heavily involved with Numba, and Numba is kind of our gateway into performance Python. So Numba is a just-in-time compiler. It works with Python code, and it basically drops the Python code down to LLVM, and through LLVM, you can access all sorts of performance critical computing. But we've done work with Parallel Accelerator, which finds patterns in code that it can exploit, exploit in parallel. We had a, a, a really cool data frame compiler, which basically took data frames and pythons and turned them into distributed programs. Um, then more recently, uh, a group at Intel working with Todd um, came up with a way to map uh, from number code starting from data parallel uh, uh, routines in Python and to map it onto CQ, CP, GPU code through Sickle. So how do you get performance on a CPU? And in the SciPy talk, I'd spend a lot of time talking about this. You folks all know this. You need threads. You need vectorization. You need cache optimization. So, but you need the threads so you can use all those cores at the same time. Um, now, the, the problem is, in Python, they have something called the global interpreter lock. When I first heard about this, I thought I was going to throw up. Because what it does is it says that if a thread, you can have multiple threads, but if one of those threads actually does anything, then we're going to lock the other threads so they can't make progress. So only one thread at a time can make progress. And I looked at that and I went like, they really been that stupid. That's the dumbest thing in the world. Oh my goodness, this sucks. But, you know, out of fairness, you know, the goal of the Python creators is something that's safe, user-friendly. You know, if, if you use this GIL, the global interpreter lock, you're not going to get data races. And so it stops all parallel multi-threading. But, you know, now you got thread safety. Now you've got a much safer environment, and that's what they chose to emphasize. So um, what we need to do is get rid of that gill and generate code that gets around it. And how are we going to do that? We're going to do it through Numba. So this, this is my cartoon for how we implemented PyOM. And so you start with your normal Python code, and you generate the Numba IR. And we're going to use something, and you'll see it in some up-and-coming slides. In Python, it's called a context manager. Um, so we use the Python context manager to pass strings into the code. 
And so after we generate the number intermediate representation, we then parse those strings and convert it into OpenMP tags so that we have now number intermediate representation with the OpenMP IR nodes. So now we're going to convert that into LLVM and then map it onto OpenMP pseudo calls and tags, which we will then map onto an LLVM layer. And for the numbers in this presentation, we use the Intel LLVM compiler, but as I said earlier, we're working our butts off to get this into an open source uh, LLVM compiler. So the blue are just standard Python components. We didn't have to do anything to them. The red, we had to work on ourselves. And of course, the purple is uh, that Intel specific technology. OK, let's look at a few examples. And if you've ever heard me give talks about OpenMP before, you know I'm obsessed about what are the core design patterns. I like this because it gives us a way to think about algorithms and classes of algorithms. So I'm going to talk about the class of loop level parallelism, the class of single program multiple data, and the class of divide and conquer. And I submit that these three classes here cover the overwhelming majority of programs that people write with OpenMP. And I'm going to use my favorite Hello World program, the numerical integration program. You sum the area under the curve. And uh, you're approximating that integral. And the integral, if you integrate it from 0 to 1, this definite integral gives you a value that should be pi. And the program is so simple. It's just these, you know, uh, what is that, 10 or so lines of Python on the side there for that single loop. So let's see what this looks like. So I have to import my uh, OpenMP context. Um, so this is the context manager that understands OpenMP. So I have to import that. And then I have to call the number JIT compiler. So that's that at NJIT. That's before my function. Then I find the loop, and I go with OpenMP, and then a string. And that string's going to be passed in and processed by the OpenMP layers inside Numba that we added inside Numba. So I pass in the string, parallel for private X reduction plus sum. Okay? The beauty of this is that's exactly the same as OpenMP, you know, as in C OpenMP. So if you know OpenMP, you know Pi OpenMP. And uh, that parallelizes the loop. I create a team of threads with parallel. I split up the loop iterations with four, and I have my data environment clause private X to give each thread its own X. And then I'm going to do a reduction over sum. So this is great. And, and I love it. This is just a, a, a elegant Pythonic way to move OpenMP into Python. But of course, Python performance sucks. And the performance would be and totally suck. No, whoa, what's this? I was shocked when I saw this the first time. And I smile every time I see it now. We got pretty much, pretty much the same performance a little bit slower, but not significantly slower than we did with C. Now, I'm going to be, you know, totally honest here. I didn't include the JIT time. The JIT time took, you know, the just-in-time compiler time took about one and a half seconds, and I'm not including that. And I'm not including it because we cache that. So in a real application, you would do the JIT compilation just once, and then you'd cache it, and, and then you'd amortize that as you call it again and again. So I, I think it's the right thing to not include that JIT time in the performance numbers, just to put it in the caption and remind you that, yeah, well, after one and a half seconds to get things compiled, look how we ran. But this just blew me away that we would get this, pretty much the same performance as C with OpenMP and the same scaling. So I, I was just thrilled. The next pattern is SPMD. Okay, you can do it for loops, but everyone knows, especially when you get to more complex data structures or more construct complex control flows, or if you need to explicitly manage the, um, the how things map onto the system because you're dealing with NUMA systems, SPMD is something OpenMP programmers fall back on quite often. Um, so how does it look when we use the SPMD pattern? with pi open MP. Here it is. Um, so I have that same from number import the context as open MP. That doesn't change. But now I'm going to use a couple runtime functions. So I import those. Um, I create a team of threads. Now this is the SPMD pattern where you 
look at the number of threads in the thread ID, and from that you split up the work. And so I do that here. I get my thread ID. I have a single construct, so only one thread records the number of threads. Uh, the other's weighted a barrier, and then I enter my loop. And uh, gee, that's all there is to it. The, I can't emphasize enough. This looks like just what I would do in a C program. Once again, the performance pretty much matches C. So uh, uh, just just fascinating the performance you get. I guess I shouldn't be so surprised, even though I always will be. But <laughs> you know, once you're running, you're mapping into LLVM. We're using the Intel compilers, so we're mapping onto the same LLVM that the C compiler is. So this just says that Numba is able to, when it analyzes the OpenMP, generate code that's just as efficient as the C compiler. All right, now, the more complicated case is, is tasks and tasking, and there the classic pattern is divide and conquer, where you recursively split a problem, you keep splitting and splitting it till you get a sub-problem that's small enough to solve directly, you solve it, and then you go through and you merge them, and you're done. So this is what the code looks like. And once again, if you looked at the C code and, and, and looked at the C for doing this, it's directly immediately analogous. So you know, at one place, so we start on the right side of the screen, I create the parallel team, and I have a single thread called the recursive function to start the computation. I test, now I'm back on the left side of the screen, I test if I'm beneath the minimum block size. If so, I solve directly. If not, I recursively split it. That's the with OpenMP task. I split it into two tasks, and then I wait until those are done to merge the result. So this is exactly the same way I would do it in C. Once again, the performance. We get pretty darn close. Maybe a wee bit worse in this case than the others, but still quite respectable performance, generally matching or getting very close to the C. So PyOpenMP works. And if you were to go through this list here of all of the constructs we define in PyOpenMP, you would notice it's pretty much the same with a couple exceptions to what I call the OpenMP Common Core. So this is something I, I, I talk about a lot and I have a book about. And it just says that basically, look, the fact of the matter is OpenMP is huge, but people really just use a small subset. And this is that small subset where I can fork threads, I can work, share, or synchronize. I can modify my parallel loops with reductions or schedule clauses. Um, I can manipulate my data environment and runtime libraries to do basic control in my environment variable setting number of threads. That's just basically the common core. So as I'm coming up on the close, I'm going to go back and Go back to the problem I started with, matrix multiply. I'm going to make one immediate change. I mean, everyone knows you don't do the IJK order. You do the IKJ order. That's much, much more friendly on the memory subsystem. I mean, like, duh. <laughs> so I make that change. But other than that, that's what I'm doing. And so this is the code. And I'm not doing, believe me, I've, I've written professional matrix multiply libraries before. I know how crazy you can get in making DGEM go fast. We're just doing the brain dead easy part, which is just put a parallel loop over that outer loop um, and use Numba and use PyOpenMP. And I did the same thing in C. And once again, I get pretty much the same results. So there's plenty of room at the top, as I said at the beginning. And you can get at that plenty of room at the top using Python or using PyOpenMP or PyOp. So in summary, um, kayaking is beautiful and I get to go to beautiful places. Oh, that's the picture. No, in summary, um, so we've created a research prototype called PyOp. Um, and we, we need to do detailed benchmarking. We haven't done that yet. Benchmarking done right is extremely labor intensive and we will do it. So, um, but we haven't done it yet. And we are working to create a uh, open source backend for PyOpenMP. The number part's already open source. Uh, we, we got approval from Intel to open source that. It's already open source, you can just grab it. Um, 
and then we're mapping it onto an open source LLVM. And that's, that's moving along nicely. I think if I understand correctly, everything's done except the tasking. So you can track our progress at that GitHub repository right there. And that's all I have to say. Thank you all very much.